Genital herpes is one of the most common sexually transmitted ulcerative diseases in the world. This video examines a case of genital herpes and reviews what should be done and how it should be managed. Stick around to learn more. A 25-year-old woman went to see her primary care provider with complaints of three days of itching and burning in the genital area. Her doctor examined her and sent off a blood test for herpes simplex type 1 and 2 antibodies, both of which came back positive. Her husband of two years had no history of genital herpes and a blood test was done on him. The blood test results for the husband showed that he was positive for herpes simplex type 1, but not for herpes simplex type 2. The woman was very disturbed and distressed because she was planning to have a pregnancy within the next year. What should be done in this situation, and what's the possible explanation of this scenario? Genital herpes is one of the commonest ulcerative sexually transmitted diseases in the world. In fact, in 2016, it was estimated that within the 14 to 49 age group, at least 190 million people were infected with herpes simplex type 1 genital infections. Within the same age group, at least 600 million people were infected with herpes simplex type 2 genital infections. The virus is usually spread through close contact with people who are infected or who are shedding the virus. Type 1 virus generally causes infections above the belt, whereas type 2 viruses generally infect persons below the belt. But this is not a hard and fast rule. And in fact, either virus can infect either site. Type 2 infections are usually caused when people have sexual relations with partners who are either actively shedding the virus or who have active lesions. Type 1 infections are usually acquired during childhood through non-sexual means. Over the past years, the incidence of type 1 infections in childhood, however, has decreased and this has led to an increase in the number of genital type 1 infections among adolescents because adolescents when they reach puberty and engage in sexual activity do not have the protective antibodies that they would have acquired had they been infected earlier in childhood. The virus usually enters the body through breaks and scratches in the skin or mucous membrane. Once the virus makes its way into the mucosa or into the skin, it infects the superficial layer of cells known as the epithelial cells. Here it reproduces and causes an immune reaction that causes the formation of the typical lesions of herpes. These herpetic lesions begin with a flat plaque that can progress to blisters or vesicles which can then change into pustules and finally ulcerate. If these ulcers occur on the skin, they can crust over. If they are found on the mucous membranes, they can heal without crusting. Upon entering the skin, the virus is then able to enter the long processes of the sensory nerves known as axons. Once it makes its way into the axon of the neuron, the virus can then be transported to the body of the cell where it becomes dormant. The DNA of the virus takes up residence in the nucleus of the cell and can be reactivated at a later point in time through stimuli, physiologic or environmental stimuli such as fever or trauma or ultraviolet light exposure. Once reactivated, the virus can then make its way down the axon back to the surface of the body, to the skin or the mucous membrane, where it can once again cause typical herpetic lesions. Many people experience prodromal symptoms prior to the onset of these lesions. Prodromal symptoms can include itching, burning, uh, burning of urine, uh, tingling in the area, 30 minutes to 48 hours prior to the onset of the lesions. 
recurrent lesions are generally milder and they can heal much faster within five to ten days recurrent lesions from type 1 infections also occur with a lower frequency than recurrent lesions from type 2 infections but the two infections are virtually indistinguishable clinically after about four to seven days of infection the lesions the typical herpetic lesions appear on the mucosa or on the skin these can last for up to two to three weeks most primary infections however are asymptomatic and patients are not even aware that they have been infected at times like that it's almost impossible to determine the exact time of infection many of these patients continue to shed the virus asymptomatically and this becomes a major source of future infections about 50 percent of patients experience constitutional symptoms such as headache fever malaise and weakness Genital herpes infections can be diagnosed with clinical observation, but this is not a reliable method, and doctors rely on PCR testing, which is a method of detecting the DNA of the virus in the mucosal or oral secretions or in active lesions, or in some cases, they culture the virus. The gold standard for diagnosis today is the PCR test. In other cases, doctors can test the blood, do serologic tests for antibodies to herpes simplex type 1 and type 2 viruses. This is a good method for detecting prior infections as well as differentiating between type 1 and type 2 viral infections. Herpes simplex type 1 and type 2 infections in pregnancy deserves special mention because of the profound impact it can have on infants. Herpes infections in infants carries a mortality rate of 30 percent. Most infants become infected during vaginal delivery in women who are infected and who are actively shedding the virus or who have active lesions during delivery. The highest risk of infant infection takes place when the mother becomes infected while pregnant. However, recurrent infections from latent viral infection can also infect the infant during delivery. Infants can sometimes become infected while in the womb and this can lead to neurologic disease as well as stillbirth or abortion. Because of these serious complications of genital herpes in pregnancy, care providers would generally advise against a vaginal delivery and recommend a cesarean section for women with active genital herpes at the time of their delivery. More recently, care providers have been using antiviral drugs to suppress the virus during the last weeks of pregnancy. Genital herpes is generally treated with antivirals. Available antivirals include acyclovir, valcyclovir, and famcyclovir. These drugs are equivalent in efficacy, but there are differences in the cost of the drug as well as in the convenience of their use. Among these drugs, acyclovir is the least expensive, but acyclovir requires five daily doses during treatment, and this is inconvenient. The other drugs, valcyclovir and famcyclovir, are more convenient and can be used twice daily for shorter periods of time. Although the herpes virus almost never develops resistance to either of these drugs, sometimes in immunocompromised patients this can happen, and in those most cases, care providers would give a trial of foscarnet or sidofovir. The woman described at the beginning of the talk most likely has genital herpes. Because of her husband's blood results, which show that he was not infected with type 2 herpes simplex virus, he is unlikely to be the source of her herpes 2 infection. The woman's herpes 2 genital infection could have been acquired years prior to her marriage. The couple should be advised to use a condom while having intercourse, and they should be advised against having sexual contact while the woman has active lesions. The woman should be offered suppressive therapy with one of the three drugs used to treat genital herpes. 
Suppression in one of these drugs has been shown to decrease the rate of transmission to the negative partner by at least 50%, but the risk of transmission is not completely eliminated. In the event the woman decides to have a pregnancy, it is important for her to discuss her genital herpes history with her OBGYN at the prenatal visit. I hope this video provided you with useful information on genital herpes. If you enjoyed the video and found it useful, please like and share the video and subscribe to the channel so we can continue to provide you with useful information on interesting topics in medicine. Thank you for watching.